Good evening, uh, dear brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ and uh, dear young people. I welcome you all to our Bible class tonight and uh, take this opportunity also to uh, welcome all our brothers and sisters and families that are joining us through these streaming services. Tonight, uh, brothers and sisters, we are in for a treat uh, with uh, two talks uh, planned uh, tonight to be presented by our brothers uh, Peter Pullman and Brother Steve Dowling. And at the uh, allocated time, Brother Peter will be first up to present his talk on unfamiliar hymns. And tonight he'll be considering hymn 173. And then later, Brother Steve will uh, come up to speak on the main talk on priorities in life as defined in the Bible. And uh, as you can imagine, as such, our agenda tonight will be slightly different from the usual, and that uh, because the talk on uh, Hymn 173 will be uh, into the evening, um, followed by an opportunity to actually sing it, there will be no opening hymn uh, tonight before the opening prayer. So the agenda to those uh, that are also streaming in, uh, the agenda will start with opening prayer uh, while we are upstanding, and then uh, followed by introduction to Brother Peter's talk, on uh, unfamiliar hymns, and uh, he's asked me to uh, pass on the message in case I forget later. Uh, hymn 173 will be discussed by Brit uh, Brother Peter first, which will um, then include the pianist, our sister Deb, playing the hymn first, uh, uh, once first, followed by us, the audience, singing it twice. So uh, just keep that at the back of your mind uh, for the later tonight. And then uh, after Brother Peter's come, uh, finished his talk, uh, we'll have the reading for the talk, uh, the second talk. That'll be on Matthew 25, verse 1 to 13 by Brother Judah. Singatale, and then Brother Steve will come forward to uh, address us on the main topic tonight, followed by announcements as usual. And then we'll close with him in prayer. Brothers and sisters, we'll ask you now to all rise as we commence with our opening prayer. Almighty God, the all-wise, supreme God and King of heaven above, the creator of all things, and to whom is due all praises, all glory, all honor. For yours is the majesty, the dominion, the heavens above and this earth beneath, and all that have life. They belong to you, and to you is due all praises. We thank you very much, Heavenly Father, for the opportunity to gather in this manner with brothers and sisters, our young people, our families, and to uh, study your word together and to find encouragement together as we continue to build one another up and building our ecclesia up in these last days. We're so truly thankful, Father, that you have caused to be recorded in many generations past and through diverse manners. Your word has been recorded through the prophets and then in the last days through the spoken words of your son. And these words have come to our ears and we've been able to hear and believe, Father, and we are truly grateful that we can see your hand at work, but also the wondrous plan that you have in store for this earth. We're very encouraged, Heavenly Father, in the knowledge that despite the challenges and the difficulties in the world around us, wars and commotions and rumors of wars and poverty and ungodliness, violence, oppression, we know that your eternal plan is that this earth will be filled with your glory as the waters cover the sea. And so we thank you and we ask, dear God, that you will strengthen our faith to the end. That we may hold on firmly to those things that you've recorded, those things concerning exceeding precious promises made to the fathers of old, which you will fulfill because you are faithful and true. We leave our class tonight in your hand, Heavenly Father, 
also in the knowledge that we are challenged with many of life's challenges. We're thinking of all our families that are not able to be with us here tonight for various reasons. We're thinking of the Penn family and the challenges that they continue to face in recent days with Brother Gary's health. And we're thinking of all those others of our members that are either physically sick or spiritually feeling low and needing your comfort and strength. We bear them up to you, O oh Father, and leave them in your loving and wonderful care. We're also thinking of those that mourn the lo loss of loved ones, the good family and the extended families. In the course of the last few weeks, we recognize the frailty and the mortality that we are subject to, Father, for all our life, and we realize how things can change so quickly and we know that you are in control. And tonight we've come to consider with our brother Steve uh, the very fact that despite the competing priorities in our life, there are things that are firm and sure, unchangeable because you are unchangeable and there is no variableness with you. And so we should place our life in your hands and rejoice in those things that you have provided, even the sure hope the hope of Israel. And so we leave tonight's class in your hand, Father, seeking your blessing in all that we do. May it all be to your glory and honor. And we pray above all for your son to return soon and your kingdom be, your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven, for when your kingdom shall be set up and the earth shall know you and the earth shall learn to honor your holy name and that your glory shall fill this earth. We praise you and thank you then through your Son, our Saviour, who has made all things possible, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As mentioned uh, earlier, brothers and sisters, in our agenda, for those that are uh, coming in now, that um, uh, due to uh, having two talks tonight, uh, our brother Peter will be first up to present on the unfamiliar hymns, and that's hymn 173. And uh, as I uh, mentioned before, and glad I'm remembered, that this will involve uh, brother Peter uh, discussing a hymn and our sister Deb, the pianist, playing it once first, and then the audience will sing it twice. Without further ado, I call up our brother Peter to please lead us. Thank you, Brother Siassi, and good evening, brothers and sisters and young people. So for those that uh, perhaps weren't at the very first of these talks a couple of years ago, um, this series of occasional talks originated from a suggestion by the Arranging Brethren to the Bible Class Committee to help the Ecclesia become more familiar with some of the less, uh, lesser known hymns in our new Green Hymn Book, and also to help us to, be, to more fully recognise the value of uh, the spiritual value of those hymns and tonight we're going to look at number 173 uh, and it would be helpful for you to have that hymn open in front of you if you don't have that there already hymn 173 we come in prayer before thy throne O god now unlike some of the other unfamiliar hymns that we've uh, looked at previously in other talks this uh, hymn at least the tune of hymn 173 might sound reasonably familiar because it has been used as a voluntary by a, number of organ a couple of organists on a number of occasions, but I believe it's only been very rarely sung at Brighton, and so it's still certainly worth considering tonight. Now, you'll see from your hymn book along the top of the book there that the hymn comes from the section in the book called God, Prayer and Confidence, which is a new section in the Green Hymn Book which we didn't have in the old 1932 Blue Hymn Book. And obviously these hymns are focusing on that really special relationship that we have through our, uh, with our God through prayer that can give us such strength and confidence. And this hymn, as we'll see, is very well placed in that section because it is depicting a prayer. 
The author and the composer of this hymn are actually not known, um, but whoever they were, um, the author definitely um, had a knowledge of scripture because there's a number of allusions to the uh, different parts of the Bible through the hymn. And the composer was a, certainly a very skillful one because, as we'll hopefully see, the music has been written in a way that's really very complementary to the words that are being sung, which is really helpful. So let's quickly look then at the hymn, uh, the words to the hymn, or really it's actually an anthem. So we'll just read those three together. We bow in prayer before thy throne, O God. Help us to worship thee. Help us to worship thee in spirit and in truth. Help us to pray. Help us to praise and hear thy word. Look down, O Lord, in mercy upon us and blot out all our transgressions. O hear our prayer, accept our praise, forgive and bless us for Jesus' sake. Forgive and bless us for Jesus' sake. Amen. So in summary, we can see that the hymn is definitely depicting a prayer, isn't it? It's the prayer of a brother or a sister at an occasion of ecclesial worship, such as a memorial meeting, and they're expressing to God their appeal that the worship that they give in prayer, in praise, in reading, and also they're seeking for forgiveness, that all of these things might be acceptable to God as they undertake them during the meeting. And so this hymn would clearly be a very appropriate opening hymn for a memorial meeting. Looking more closely at the words, there's a number of scriptural allusions here. Three of the main ones. In the second line, worshipping in spirit and truth is clearly drawn from the words of Christ in John chapter 4, verse 23, where Christ talks about the need for true worshippers to worship the Father in spirit and truth, something, of course, therefore we would equally seek to do, and most appropriately being echoed then in this hymn or prayer. Then at the bottom of the first page, the line that says, Look down, O Lord, in mercy upon us and blot out all of our transgressions is also very appropriately alluding to the words of David in Psalm 51, where he was seeking to God for forgiveness, where he says, According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. And then finally, the phrase over the page forgive and bless us for Jesus' sake is alluding to Ephesians 4 verse 32 where Paul writes to the believers that they are to forgive one another even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So what's the scene that we can picture in our minds as we then sing this hymn? It's a prayer, isn't it? And so it's an incredible, when we really think about it, an incredible reverential scene of us bowing our heads in prayer and then entering in our minds into the very presence of God in heaven. Seated on a throne of glory in intense light with the immortalised Christ seated at his right hand and an enormous group of assembled angels around them. Our prayer then, amongst all the things that God of the universe is doing, is heard by him. Christ agrees favourably with our thoughts and God accepts the prayer, taking delight in our praise of him, agreeing to our request to bless us as we read his word and in love being willing to forgive the sins we confess. This is the awe-inspiring scene that we can imagine as we sing the words of this hymn. And now finally to the music. As I said, the music's been written very skillfully to complement the words that are sung. Much of the hymn is at a moderate volume, either moderately loud MF or moderately soft MP. Also at a relatively slow speed and if you scan through the notes, you can see they're all at a relatively low pitch. And so that combination of moderate volume, relatively slow speed and lowish pitch all combines to very effectively create that feeling of reverence 
as we worship our God and appeal to him from a position of need and humility. But in contrast, there's two phrases where we sing, help us to praise. For instance, on the third line of the first page, in the middle of the line, the phrase, help us to pray, sorry, praise, appears after help us to pray. And when, you, when we sing that, you can see the music has a crescendo up to a loud volume. Very fitting for praise. And in addition, the music's been very skillfully written at a higher pitch. So it's easy to sing loud at that point as well. So it helps us then to express the idea of praise very effectively as we sing those words. Then immediately after that help us to praise that we've just looked at, the next phrase is, and hear thy word. Now the notes on the words hear thy word are all unexpectedly long compared to those that have come before it. So firstly, just on a technical note, it's important when we're singing not to get tripped up by that and rush through them because you were expecting the notes to go past quicker like the rest of them did. But why are they like that in the first place? And I think, again, the writer is trying to convey the scene of the reading of the word in a meeting, the idea that there's suddenly a period of extended quiet when the words are being heard by us and we're just quietly reflecting on them. And so, in contrast to the praise, it's longer and quieter. Then finally, the phrase at the bottom of the first page and into the next, look down, O Lord, in mercy upon us and blot out all our transgressions, is also very appropriately written because uh, the music suddenly changes into a minor key for the duration of that phrase, which in its sound is less pleasant and harmonious and more associated with the idea of mournfulness or similar sort of sentiments. And that fits beautifully then with the idea of transgressions and the need for mercy, doesn't it? And not only that, if you look at the last part of the phrase and blot out all our transgressions, more musical people will notice there that those words are uniquely across the whole hymn suddenly sung in unison. That means everybody's singing the same notes rather than people singing different notes in harmony. And that fits beautifully, doesn't it, with the idea of all of us being in equal need to have our sins forgiven. So all of us are at one level. We all sing exactly the same thing as we say to God, may you blot out our transgressions. So hopefully then with that greater understanding of the scriptural basis for the words, that picture of the prayer going before God in our minds and an understanding of the complimentary music, we can now sing with renewed understanding hymn 173. So firstly, Sister Deb will play it through once just for us to listen to, and then she'll play a chord, then we can all stand, and because it's an anthem where we only sing it through once rather than a hymn with multiple verses, I thought we'd sing it twice. So we'll sing it once, and then Sister Deb will just give a new introductory note for the second time around, and then we'll sing it a second time. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Brother Peter and uh, Sister Deb, uh, taking us through that uh, wonderful reverential prayer and praise to our Heavenly Father. To introduce uh, Brother Steve's uh, talk on uh, priorities in life as defined in the Bible, is asked that we read together Matthew chapter 25, from verse 1 to verse 13. We'll ask Brother Judah to please come forward and read for us. Brother Judah. Reading with you all, Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 to 13. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lambs and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Thank you, Brother Judah, for that reading. And I will now ask Brother Steve, please come forward to lead us in our talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for that. Uncle Peter, Uncle Sai, Aunty Deb. Very good evening, our dear brothers and sisters and young people. Welcome to our Wednesday night class. If you get the opportunity and you cannot sing like myself, you need to come down the front and hear how good it sounds now that the masks are off, because it's absolutely fantastic. Um, first off, our reading this evening. Um, I just had that reading as a little thought provoker because um, you can obviously see where priorities are shown in that small three, 13 verses. It doesn't have a lot to do with the rest of our talk for the evening, but I did think it was very important to note that everybody has time to sleep in verse 5, and it is a priority, so let's bear that in mind. Um, but again, I wanted that reading more than anything just to get your mind starting to think about priorities. So. We live in an age where time is of an absolute premium. There is no time for anything anymore. If you went back, some of you won't understand this, but if you went back 30 or 40 years ago, there seemed to be time for everything. You could spend Sunday afternoon at a friend's house and you would actually get changed and then get changed again and possibly again and then still come back for the lecture. It seems like now everything that we do, you've got an hour for this or half an hour for that and the premium of our time is just getting harder to control. There seems to be just so much for us to do and such little time to do it in. I did a little talk on priorities a little, uh, about uh, maybe 10 years ago as an exhortation and at the time there were over 140 million websites where if you search time priority or priority of time. There were 140 million results. As of last night, that number is now 9.6 billion. 
So that's how time poor we are. We're obviously spending too much time writing reports on how time poor we are. So how important is this balance of life? Put really simply, as this quote states, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting in Daniel 5. So your life is very much a set of scales. And the last thing we need or want is to be reflected like that. We have the opportunity to balance our life right, to get our times and our priorities right. We need to make sure that we have a system in place that we can do that. And it doesn't matter if you are very young or very old, we can all benefit from these systems that we can then suddenly put these priorities in our life. And so we have many priorities. So if you take your whole life and then you split it up into, okay, what are some of these things that are in my life? Everything is important. There's not one thing that is a, a really unimportant thing if you want a proper balance. You can work your whole life and then when you die, you worked your whole life and you died and you have nothing to show for it. Nobody on their deathbed has ever said, if I just stay back at work that extra hour. Mm -hmm. They don't ever say that. The most common thing most people said was, I wish I had a little bit more fun. I wish I spent a little bit more time with my family. That is the number one people, thing people say on their deathbed. They don't say, if I just had that other car, if I just had a little bit more money, if I had that other pair of shoes, you know? Maybe not the shoes. Um, so each of those things are important. They play a balancing act that is important for us. So how do we make this balance work in our lives? What are we going to do to make sure that our lives are as simple, as easy as possible, and we can reflect back and go, that is important or that is not? So we make priorities, OK? Uh, yes, that's my phone number up there, so if anybody watching in wants to send in their answer as well, you can. I'm watching. So what I'd like to do is get my scribe up, because my writing and spelling is so awful, I thought it would be a lot easier to recruit Mr Peter Pullman. So the bit that I got right was that, because I actually copied it off the piece of paper in front of me. I'm just going to use this for one second. Um, so with priorities. What makes a priority? So the most important thing for us with the word priorities that is written there. Oh, hello. Thanks, James. Um, so priorities, really simple. That word there, before you do anything, prior to setting out for the day, prior to going to do something for a friend, prior to sitting down and doing study. What do you do before you do that? So the priority is that thing that even before you start, for a baby, the first thing you do is breathe. That's the prior thing that everybody knows is the most important thing. Okay? So prior, and I'm pretty sure Latin for itties is the other stuff, but Priorities, it's always what is most important first before we get into it. Okay? So, thanks, Pete. Sorry. So, with everybody's help, I would like you to throw as many priorities as you can think of. Um, I'll start you off. Put shoes down in the bottom right-hand corner. Okay? So, we're not restricting ourselves. That's all I wanted to bring that point up for. Okay? Okay? Um, what are priorities, please? Now, we will say, if, if we say sport, we don't need to hear air hockey table as a subcategory. We can just go with sport and assume that includes keeping the balloon off the ground and stuff like that. Family? Family? I'm waiting for our first person to write one in. So you'll have to, if you're in the back hall, you may need to... Bible reading. Bible readings, fantastic. Prayer. Prayer. 
Come on, I want to hear Peter at least once say slow down. Music. Ecclesial life. Up, oh, we've got one. Luke Nichols, coffee. Yes, your name's on there, Luke, so I am going to mention that. Aren't you actually here? <laughs> He's in the back hall. <laughs> Very clever. Okay, learning at school. <laughs> okay, John Nichols, walking in God's creation. <laughs> it has to be over 10 kilometres or it's not a walk, as far as John's concerned. <laughs> Preaching. Preaching, yes. Ah, we have an anonymous one, food. You can put your name in there as well if you'd like me to call out your name. Sorry? Water, very important. Sleep. Sleep, yes, we had that one, that's very important. Cleaning. Cleaning. Yeah. Cleaning. Don't write that one up. Um, <laughs> friends. <laughs> friends, brilliant. Okay, I'll give you one that's not up there yet. Try God. Come on, we've got a full whiteboard. Gardening, yes. Relationships, anonymous. Transport. Transport. Ooh, wow, they're coming in fast. <laughs> Mems. Okay. Mems, Nahum. Jesus. Memes. Is it memes? 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 Talking to a person over 50, I don't know some of these. So we got Jesus. Uh, anybody else in the room? Jokes. <laughs> Obviously, I just wrote that to myself. Work. Work. Thank you, Darren. Yeah. Caring for others, Nathan Taylor. Bible study. Bible study, fantastic. Health. Health. Very good. Should have been right up the start, but... Some of us understand it's not that important. You can all think of one thing at least. Holidays. Holidays, excellent. Is preaching up there? Yep, excellent. House, House yes. Um, children, uh, that's part of family, I suppose, in some cases. Travel. Travel. So let's see, did we cover uh, on this one? Were all of those up there? Finances, you could put money up there. I suppose some people think that's important. Personal development, which is really learning, so if you want to save yourself. Pardon? Shopping? Oh, hobbies. Oh, hobbies, yes. And shopping. <laughs> Boys, you can say your car if you want to, or lack of car. Yeah. Toyota Corolla specifically, yes. Bike. Bike, good. Yes, cycling in some people's cases. Put in brackets, lycra. Mm -mm. <laughs> you don't need to. <laughs> okay. Have we got a good enough list? Thank you very much, Peter. So, and thank you to all those that wrote in. Um, somebody wrote pets as well. So there's one that we didn't have. So animals. Some people treat their animals sometimes maybe a little bit better than family members. Or well, they are their family members. You wouldn't believe what I had a gentleman buy a caravan with bunk beds so his dog had somewhere to sleep. <laughs> so it's just, yeah. Um, so all of these can be considered as a priority in our life. There is no wrong to what some of these priorities may be. 
What's wrong is maybe the order that we put them in. So we have been blessed by a God who has given us the ability to ride a bike with a pair of shoes on while shopping with our dog and then go home and have a sleep. They are blessings that we're being given to us that we can enjoy. But if our shopping happens every day, every day before God or our friends or prayer, then we're unbalanced and we have that problem with the scales going in one direction. So the way I'm going to teach it to you tonight, a little bit of a Uncle Kevin and Uncle Tim thing, but we are all jars. Okay, and this is the way I'm going to do it. Now, entirely up to you, but if you want to pass them along, we have some jars for you to fill. So when I say jars, so if you imagine the human body is a jar, what's in the human body? Well, there's a couple of really main things that if you didn't have it, you're going to collapse on the ground. So things like a heart is pretty important. Some would question the brain. Um, livers, things like that. Kidneys, you don't need all of them. They're overrated. Um, so again, not as important. Blood's fairly important. Um, a skeleton, or you'd be on the ground. Things like that. Skin, some people don't have as much skin. You can go through life with one arm. Things like that. So they're important parts, and there's parts that aren't as important. Hair, overrated. So, okay. So it's working out what are the important things, and that's what we're going to use our jar for. We need to establish what things go in the jar. Okay? We have water, we have sand, we have pebbles, we have rocks. Obviously, the rocks are the big things. They are the important things. You start your day with a rock, you're starting on the right foot. Okay? The rock is like a heart or a brain. It's not your pinky finger. Okay? So, what we're going to do is go through, I believe, there are five main big things. And of those five, you can basically say there are subcategories. So, things like um, having fun or the other stuff that you have in your life would be considered things like gardening and shopping and shoes and um, maybe holidays, things like that. They're not the most important thing, but they would all be in that other things category. Whereas when we talk about God as a category, that would definitely include things like prayer, Bible reading, things like that. Okay? So again, it's not just that's the only thing in that category. So, our first priority. Really simple. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis has an amazing, very simplified list of the priorities that we should look at. So, in Genesis chapter 1, in verse 1, really simple. In the beginning, God. The first five words of the Bible spells it out plain and clearly. That is our number one priority. So we have our timeline, our priorities listed. So the first thing, God is our number one priority before anything else. And we can write down these quotes. If somebody has, there are lots and lots of quotes. It's a matter of, we can't look them all up. I brought the wrong Bible that I can't turn the pages very quickly on. But Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning, God. Uh, in Matthew 6 verse 33, and if somebody finds it before me and would like to read it out, they're more than welcome to. I am going to be slightly crippled on this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So Matthew 6 verse 33. A brilliant, brilliant quote. What is really good about it, on top of the fact that it says, seek first God, you wake up, God, number one thing. You do that, and this is what it's telling us, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And then after that, and his righteousness, and all these things will then be added unto you. But that's the priority. First God, 
than everything after that. Okay? So in Deuteronomy 6 verse 5, we have, and again, sorry about the... So Deuteronomy 6 verse 5, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. As I said, I could put another 30 or 40 quotes up there. This is an opportunity where, again, with that little piece of paper, it's worth just getting them and putting extra ones down there if you can because it just spells it out clearly for us. What is that number one priority? Does anybody else have a quote that they can tell us? Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1, one, which says... I'll look it up. I've got the microphone. So Hebrews 1 verse 1. So Hebrews 1 verse 1. God, at sundry times and in divers manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Yep. Yep. So again, like Genesis, everything starts with God. Okay, so that's what you term a big rock. It's a pretty, not pretty important, it is the most important. Okay, so what would be the next thing? So as I said, we're not skimming off or just running past things like how important prayer is in our life. Yep. That's Psalms 18 verse... Adding verse 2, the Lord is my rock. Yep. Again, sorry, I brought a concordance Bible that I'm not used to. It's got the same outside cover as my other one. <laughs> That's right. Um, so, yeah, we're not. So, if I was going to do it like this, so with God, so that becomes part of that, that becomes part of that. In a sense, sometimes if it's worship, music can become part of it. Um, I'm going to wait. Um, Wait, uh, but God, very much Jesus, Bible study. So they're all in that category, okay? So again, the gospel message, the things of Jesus concerning Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God, that is part of knowing God. So they're all in the one. And as I said, I'm not brushing off some of the things that we haven't talked about or quotes to say how important prayer is and Bible reading and Jesus. But I just want to lay the foundation for us with the time we have so that we can then dig and make it deeper still. Um, So the next priority. So number one is God. So the next one. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, as shown in Joshua. So the next one is our family. So God, then family. And again, as I said, Genesis 1 and 2 is brilliant for showing this right back at the start of time, these priorities. Where it talks about in Genesis 1 verse 22, it says, And God bless them, and God sent to them, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. So that was a priority. After he made everything, He made man, woman, and said, now replenish the earth. In Psalm 127, verse 3. Sorry about this. So Psalm 127, verse 3. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord... Oh, you should have known this from going to school, actually. Um, an inheritance for the law of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Um, Deuteronomy 6, verse 6. I should have done these in order. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I have a bigger, easier Bible to use. Thank you, Mum. <laughs> 
Oh, wow. Okay, excellent. Um, so Deuteronomy 6, verse 6. Is somebody there before me? Here we go. Got it. 6, verse 6 says, wrong page. Um, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and thou, they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, etc. So that's talking about the family side of it. Just winding it back a little bit, God, before you get to a family, it's a relationship between a husband and a wife. So, again, it's great saying the family is really important. If you don't have one, it's that relationship, the husband and the wife. And I think I've told a few people here, Stephen Hill from up at Aberfoyle Park taught my wife and I that the most important thing for a couple is to be holding hands, facing each other and have a Bible in front of you and you will never go wrong. He said the difficult challenge is when a little child goes between you and her hand on this side and then you and her hand on that side, your family is growing, but you can never lose that contact between your husband and wife because it's so important. And everything the children see is what they see from the husband and wife as well. And as soon as you go, what's that over there, and you let go and you're not looking at your Bible things become more difficult again. So your priorities shift from family, wife, Bible, or God, suddenly becomes something else that's not as important. So, um, so 1 Timothy 3, there's a few in that one chapter. So 1 Timothy 3, and in verse, we might skip through a couple of these. So um, 1 Timothy 3, um, first at verse 2, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behaviour, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Um, those things, uh, verse 5, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the ecclesia? of God, um, and then verse 8 as well, likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy, etc. It's essentially saying, put your house in order first. Put really nicely, okay, using my terms. House first, family first, political party. Um, but if you have that correct, then everything else starts from there. So God in your household leads for a more successful relationship, relationship with your children, relationship with your wife, etc. So in that order. So with family, that's in one section. Um, I don't think house, it's important for a family, but not the most important thing. Um, that's really everything in the family one. So not too much in that but you can see the importance with partnerships, etc. This isn't saying that somebody that chooses to be single can't have this great priorities list. It's just different. Um, and there's a couple more quotes there as well. So after that, as far as a priority list is concerned, so again, we're going to go back to Genesis because really interesting... The next, and I'll go back to this, so the next priority is work, okay? So the order that God had in the Bible, he went work, 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 rest and reflect. That was the order God made it from the very beginning. So, oh, pardon me. Is that better? So, so the work part of life, 
there are so many, and I wanted to put even more quotes up there, but please write these down because you'll see the importance of it. So when, back in Genesis, God put Adam and Eve in the garden, the first commandment to them was, Behold, I've given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of the earth, every tree in which there's seed, and you'll have it for meat. Um, and he put them in there and he said, look, I want you to keep this, I want you to... And then even in cursing them, he said, you'll now have to work even harder to make your way. So work is important, it has its place. Is there anything, and again, using my language, is there anything more useless to a family or to an ecclesia than a person who is able to but does not work, who chooses not to work, who chooses not to essentially make their own way. You cannot expect to have not a free ride in life if you are able to work. You need to pay bills at home. You need to be able to support your family. You need to be able to support your ecclesia and do the things necessary for you, you can't do that if you're not working. So working is a very important part of it. What you work as or how you do that is a completely different thing. If you find that your work is then every Sunday and every other day and you don't have any time for family or God, that is incorrect work. If you have a, what they, they love this one, there's probably more than 200 billion of these, work-life balance. If you do have a work-life balance, you will go to work and still come home in time to enjoy family, to spend time around God, to be there for your brothers and sisters. And that is the correct way God has made it. Um, some of the great examples of this, we'll cut to the last two. So 1 Thessalonians 4... Turn this straight away. Well, um, First Thessalonians four verse ten, and indeed ye do it towards all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more, and that ye study to be quiet, to do your own business, and to work with your own hands, as we commanded you, that ye may walk honestly towards them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. So this is encouragement to please keep working. The last thing Paul, and I think it's in the Second Thessalonians 3 verse 10, and we'll just check it, 3 verse 10, for even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any of you would not work, neither should he eat. So one of the biggest examples they showed was that they went into a community, they helped them, they preached, they built them up, but they worked. They worked their way so they could afford their food, they could afford their rent, and they were the example for the brothers and sisters. They didn't just stand there and say, I'm teaching you what you should do, now you feed me. And that's a really important lesson. But as we said, it's that balance. So again, when it comes to that rock, things like, um, I'd probably put coffee in that, learning, um, so technically your house can be in that because that's what you're providing for. The word work is up here somewhere there, work. Um, so all of those things. Now health should have been in family, apologies, that is part of family. You can't be a good husband if you can't get off the ground and walk with your kids. Um, but yeah, so work encapsulates some important parts, the money part, things like that. Anybody have any other quotes they want to share with us on that? Could ecclesial life go in family? To an extent, but you have to be very careful that you don't go and spend all your time. So if, I don't know what it's like, but you imagine if you were a world-class speaker and you spent all your time travelling the world, building up everybody, and meanwhile your home is going to rack and ruin because you're not there to guide it. Your house and your family and your children come first. So that's a really important balance. 
So again, you can be the best person, write 20 books that everybody gets upliftment out of, but if your child's there going on the study door and you go away, you've just disobeyed one of the most important rules that God's given us. So again, that's proper time management. So again, you can march into the kingdom with all these people you've converted if your son's left outside, you failed. So, so the next one is the ecclesia. So again, a person that's got God as the centre of their heart, their family is on the same page as you, you're working and providing for your family and have enough to provide for others as well, Ecclesial life is 100% then your focus, as much as you can. So, and again, the ecclesial life aspect of it very much is you with your family being there for everybody. It's pointless you showing up by yourself with none of your family. Because all you're showing is, I haven't succeeded at home, but I'll come and pretend everything's okay here. So it's a really important thing to look into. Okay. So ecclesial life, there are so many parts of ecclesial life that could be just the simple thing of picking up a phone call, or picking up a phone as well and making a call, things like that. And the other thing is, so if you're sitting there going, well, friends are a really important part of what I consider to be one of my priorities, and if you look at your phone and you haven't called any of them in a week, maybe readdress if that's one of your priorities. If you think a priority of yours is preaching but you haven't spoken to anybody at work about what you believe or you're not a shining light that's a bit different and everybody goes, what's different about him? It might not be your priority. Don't kid yourself because, again, you cannot lie to God about your situation. So the ecclesia. So if we look at 1 Peter 5... So 1 Peter 5, verse 1 to 4. The elders which are among you I exhort, who I am also an elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you. Do you notice he says the elders? It would be very hard to be a 25-year-old, newly married, one baby, to be somebody taking on a huge amount of responsibility in your ecclesia. In the old times, a person, when they were first married, they were given a whole year off to establish their relationship at home with their wife and set things in the order that they should be before they had to come back and be in the army and do things like this. That's how important it was. So the elders are the people that have this experience. They're the ones that their children are doing the right thing because at home they've established it first. They're following God, they're the example, and then they can move on. They've worked, they've made their living, and they've got some free time. They've got experience. They can be the person that guides and leads and helps the ecclesia. So they're the ones that feed the flock. And we'll have a look. So Galatians 5 verse 13 So Galatians 5 verse 13, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So it's basically saying you've been given the experience, you've been given the tools. Use them. Use them for those around you. Again, I would love to have spent so much more time on each of these aspects. The last one, as we pointed on before, is anything. 
is circle all the other stuff, whether it's cleaning, jokes, shopping, whatever it is. If you've filled your jar with all these things in the correct order, that is exactly your life will have plenty of time for whatever it is on there or anything else that you may wish to pursue. But I'm sorry, but if you're buying a racing car and you're off every weekend and we haven't seen you for months and months because that's your priority, what do we do? So anything. And there are quotes there as well. And the best one is, again, Matthew 6, verse 33, the one that starts us at the start. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added unto you. So, just to finish off, we've got a couple of minutes. I have a couple of helpers that are going to come up. Yes, I was going to still do it. So what we're going to do, I'm going to give you a little example now. Hopefully the teaching side of me does work, but I'll blame the girls if it doesn't work. Um, I'm going to show you the little exercise that should stick in your mind as far as how you fill your life with the correct things as opposed to the incorrect things. Now, I'm just going to lift this up carefully because it did knock it over last time I tried it. Just pull that side really tight. That's it. Excellent. So we have... And we're going to move this to the front so the girls can get super embarrassed. There we go. Yep. So we have here two jars. I learnt from doing the exhort at Barossa, don't use glass ones because it cracked them. Um, so what I'd like you to do, uh, person on the right, which one's got more? Um, the one on the right's got more than the one on the left. If the one on the left puts water in first, then sand, then gravel, then rocks, and then the one on the right, if you put the rocks in first, And you can both start at the same time, so you can go now. Um, But this just shows how important prioritising your life is. Um, I haven't actually measured this out to see if it works, so we'll just see what happens. Um, But the idea is that you have so much space in you to fill. If you do it the incorrect way, and you can almost tip it all in. So... We'll see how close we get. So again, the very little stuff, water is the little stuff. It's having a coffee with a friend, which is a great thing to do if you've got time to do it. Um, The sand is going off and playing sports with your friends. Again, a great thing to do if you've got all the other things in place. The gravel is those slightly more important things. It might be a, a course that's doing art at uni, it's useless, it doesn't do anything for you, but you might like the certificate at the end of it. It's not important though. Um, And then, again, the rocks are the big things. (laughs) And this is probably the first time ever everything's going to fit in on the wrong side as well as the right side, (laughs) because I didn't measure the water out correctly. Um, But you'll get the idea. So again, if just fill it all up. So every other time I've done this, you can never fit, and it's probably because I've gone safety on the plastic side and not had a proper jug lid, you cannot fit. <laughs> Look at that. Um, thank you, girls, very much. <laughs> so having said that, it just completely ruined the whole ideal because normally... If you fill your jar with, and you can see it in the picture, if you put the water in, then the sand, then the gravel, then you try and jam the rocks into the lid, it doesn't fit. Wrong jugs. Um, But I can still use those at home so that they were the right jugs. Um, But if you put your priorities in order first, the big things in, then the smaller things, then the smaller things, you have space for everything in your life. And you can enjoy it more because everything else is in the correct order. So I suppose the lesson that comes from this is using those jars, get to learn those quotes if we can. They're important in my life massively and it is a really good opportunity to just set those things out that you can see them. And then if you do it, you can be filled with everything that's important. So thank you.
you uh, very much, Brother Steve, um, for that very interactive uh, evening. And I'm sure, Brother and Sisters, uh, you agree with me that the points have been uh, quite aptly made, uh, with Brother Steve uh, helping us to uh, go over the many priorities that tend to compete in our lives, but uh, it can all be uh, fit in a nice framework where we can still, uh, um, as uh, Brother Steve's mentioned today, as long as we are putting first things first, uh, we can still uh, live a life that, uh, um, to the praise and glory of our God. And we try and do all to the glory of our God. And uh, he's pointed us to Matthew 6, um, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and everything shall be added unto you. And so uh, thank you again, Brother Steve. And uh, this time we have uh, the announcements to be made. Brother Dave, thank you. Thanks, Brother Steve. So collection tonight is for ACBM, or EFT. And God willing, our next uh, class is not till the 15th, because next week we've got the business meeting. Um, further this week, uh, on Sunday, we have Brother Knut Kruger giving us uh, the exhortation. Brother John Penn is chairman. Brother John Atkins is reader. Sister Beck Arch is organist. In the evening, Brother Luke Nichols is to give the public lecture, and Brother Judah Rasingatali is chairing that night. Uh, and there's a youth group supper after the lecture that night. Thank you, uh, Brother Dave. And uh, brothers and sisters, we now bring our evening together to a close, and uh, what a lovely evening it's been. It's been good to be here in the middle of our week to be encouraged in our faith. And uh, we've uh, uh, spent a lovely family time together um, from uh, the uh, <coughs> talk that uh, Brother Peter uh, helped us through with the uh, uh, awareness of our praise and our prayer in song, and then uh, Brother Steve helping us through one of life's challenges and um, prioritizing in our life. And um, just looking across, uh, yeah, I think uh, I was going to ask uh, <coughs> a brother, but um, we'll ask Brother Micah as a stand-in for closing prayer after we've sung together hymn 356. Thank you. <laughs>
Let's pray. Our dear, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this night that, and for the time that we've had to come together and to look at your word and to hear about priorities and to think about our own lives and what our priorities are. And we thank you for that beautiful quote that we have from your son Jesus, which we've just sung. And we pray that you'll help us to do this in our lives, to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. And all these things will be added unto us. Help us to put you first and to keep striving to look for that day when all the other things in this life that sometimes take up so much of our time and our headspace, all of them will not matter so much anymore. And we pray that you'll help us to take this into our week ahead and that you'll be with us all and we pray you'll continue to be with all those who are going through tough times at the moment. And in particular, we pray you'll continue to be with the Penn family and with Brother Gary and also with the Gert family. And we pray all these things through your son's name, the Lord Jesus Christ. 